you clearly think that uh, uh, international law, the way it exists uh, now, is uh, too Eurocentric, and it's uh, and that it is too much the product of uh, our current specific situation. Uh, of course, it has not always been the case. Uh, in some of your work, uh, you talk about the coexistence of regional civilizations in the pre 20th century world. So tell us a bit about uh, this pre -century, 20th century world in which uh, somehow uh, international law was not as Eurocentric as it is today. Well, uh, during the most period of human history, the globe was not unified either by economic or military or ideational uh, terms. And uh, there are various types of regional civilizational spheres with their uh, distinctive normative ideas. For example, in East Asia, we had Sinocentric uh, civilizational regional system with Confucianism and Buddhism, Taoism, and some other uh, religions and ethical and normative ideas underlying these civilizations. In major part of Eurasia, there were Islamic civilizational fields where people believed in Islam in the wider sense of the term. There were, of course, uh, great diversity according to regions and according to time, but nevertheless, there were uh, various types of Muslim uh, dynasties, Muslim political and religious entities, and they were uh, flourishing with their uh, normative ideas, mainly focused on Sharia, and uh, they had very active uh, relationship, trade and intellectual and even military relationships with European world and also East Asian world. In Europe, there were, uh, again, a regional civilizational system centered on Christianity and medieval uh, decentralized uh, political structures. There, uh, people lived as Christians and also as a member of small communities. In those days, generally speaking, uh, Europe was far less developed than Muslim worlds and East Asian worlds. But nevertheless, uh, these three civilizational uh, areas actively engaged in exchanging uh, material and spiritual uh, goods and uh, were uh, prosperous. In other regions, for example, Indian uh, subcontinent or American continent, and uh, in Oceania and in Africa, there were also various types of regional civilizational fields, areas. So in these uh, coexisting uh, regional civilizations, there were distinctive normative ideas uh, with uh, substantial basis of economic systems, political systems, and religious systems. So it is only very recent uh, years that we have this one system of global international law, which was first born in Europe and extended to a global <coughs> uh, size. That has been a very, very simplistic, uh, uh, very sketchy view of the world history from the viewpoint of uh, international normative system. <clears throat> but so in this pre-20th century landscape, if you will, so I I international law didn't really exist, or international law was essentially uh, a regional exercise because it was attached to these regional civilizations, right? Well, yes. Uh, what we call international law today was born in modern Europe, and before that time, 
uh, people communicated with other based on their respective normative systems. For example, for Europeans, Christianity and European way of communication were taken for granted. Mm -hmm. For Muslims, Islam and Sharia and its, uh, its uh, uh, kind of an international form of Siyar, uh, which is basically a kind of a Islamic international law, uh, mm -hmm. which is not a very correct uh, saying, but still we can uh, simply refer to that. Uh, so each side communicated with each other based on their own normative systems and tools of communication. Then, how was it possible for those different peoples belonging to different civilizations to communicate yes. each other? Mm -hmm. Well, there were some tools on each side through which they could communicate with each other. For example, in the uh, Muslim world, there were a concept of coexisting, coexistence of various uh, religious communities. And as you may know, uh, Islamic world was in this respect far more generous to different religions than Christian world. After the reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula by Catholics, many Jews and other uh, religious peoples were expelled or escaped from uh, Iberian Peninsula to North, Af North Africa and other regions. So from the viewpoint of the Islamic uh, civilizational normative system, it was not so difficult to communicate with other people belonging to different uh, religious systems uh, with each other. From the viewpoint of uh, Europeans, uh, it was slightly more difficult because, as I said, Catholic was not so generous as Islam in this respect, but still there were practical tools. For example, the norm of Pacta Sunt Servanda, uh, agreement is binding, was regarded as a kind of a, a natural law tool with which they could communicate even with those who are not Christians. From the viewpoint of Sinocentric uh, East Asian world, uh, again, it was a little bit difficult to communicate with other people because Sinocentrism has a very strong sense of uh, superiority centered on China. And according to this uh, view, all other people were regarded as barbarians. Mm -hmm. We Japanese are East Barbarians and Europeans are Southern Barbarians because they came from South, not necessarily from West. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit difficult. But still, Chinese civilization had a very pragm pragmatic aspect. And the Sinocentric uh, tribute system was very flexible in allowing various types of different uh, belief systems so they could communicate with each other. Yet, with the lack of global international law, these mm -hmm. communications were not so stable. It was strongly influenced by the power relationships. For mm -hmm. example, when the Ottoman Empire was very powerful, the relationship between the Muslims and Europeans were centered on Muslimic notion of diplomacy. But gradually, Ottoman Empire declined, and then Eurocentric international law and diplomacy became more prevalent, and Ottoman Empire were made to more subjugated position. So it heavily depended on the actual power relationships. Of course, even today, international law is strongly influenced by the actual power uh, oh, yes. structures. Mm -hmm. But still, compared with those pre-modern period, mm 
international law is far more independent and far less directly influenced by power relations. So uh, uh, on the one hand you are saying that in pre-20th century uh, uh, era somehow you had a bit of a parity among the legal regions uh, uh, of the world. On the other hand, as you just mentioned, uh, this parity fluctuated with the evolution of power. Well, yes. Uh, from a longer perspective, you could talk about parity between major civilizational spheres, uh, such as uh, East Asian and Muslim. Islamocentric and Eurocentric. But uh, in other regions, there are not so many uh, mutual relationships, active engagement in terms yeah. of trade, and etc. So it is not so useful to talk about parity or etc. But yeah. from uh, the viewpoint of these three uh, leading spheres of civilizations, From a longer perspective, there were uh, a rough parity. Yeah. And, and so for everything changes with the uh, unification of the world. And it's interesting that you, you talk about uh, um, um, the, the, the coexistence of original civilizations in the pre 20th century. So you, you, you think that all the way to, I mean, from the 15th century all the way to the 20th century, somehow, you know, we haven't yet. Uh, we still have a sense of coexistence. Well, yes. Uh, one of the characteristic features of the modern international law, which became global, was the coexistence of sovereign states. Mm -hmm. And sovereign states are free in determining their own political, economic and cultural or religious systems within their own territories. Therefore, even though West European powers and the United States have been always very, very influential and powerful uh, in this uh, West-centric global international legal system, civilizational diversities survived within the territory of sovereign states. As you know, there has been a strong principle, very, very important principle, principle of non-intervention mm -hmm. among sovereign states. And because of this non-intervention principle, various kind of diverse religions, cultural systems, economic systems, and social practices survived even during this modern period. However, from around the end of the 20th century, because of the increasing power of the idea of human rights mm -hmm. and global protection of environment, the power, the normative power of the non-intervention principle has been deteriorating. Mm -hmm. Even if some government commit a serious human rights violation within the territory of a sovereign nation state, this abuse of serious, <coughs> this serious violation of human rights is severely criticized from outside world. And it is becoming more and more difficult to resort to the principle of non-intervention to ward off these criticisms coming from outside. And therefore, a variety of civilizational and cultural and religious practices which were preserved even during the period of West-centric international legal system, they are now suffering. And the people who believe in those traditional uh, civilizational, cultural, religious precepts are feeling they are now severely being attacked by the predominant West-centric civilization. Mm 
This is one of the dangers we have to address in the 21st century world. And, and this is a major uh, development which has taken place in the past 20 years, in a way. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And uh, in this sphere, in this sense, the problem of human rights needs far more civilizational, far more historical studies and considerations than has been considered thus far. Thus far, it is understandable that people tend to criticize traditional discriminatory practices remaining in many parts of the world, especially in non-Western world, from the viewpoint of human rights and humanitarian considerations. It is quite understandable. I myself have been human rights activist for the last 40 years, and I have been engaged in the enhancing of the value of human rights myself. And yet, you have also taken into consideration of those people who are being criticized, who are attacked, that their behavior violates the fundamental norms of human rights because they have believed in these belief systems for hundreds of years, for thousands of years, and all of a sudden, within just a few decades, they are now criticized and they are now demanded to give up their yeah. civilizational beliefs, yeah. which is very, very difficult for them yeah. to swallow. No, no, we're, we're, we're going to go back to this issue of, uh, of human rights a little bit later in the conversation. But in fact, you see this kind of uh, uh, clash existing between law and uh, the use of law uh, for power purposes. I mean, is it, isn't it something which existed also previously? I mean, you know, uh, during the 19th century, international law was used as a way to justify colonialism. So is it, is it really a new phenomenon? Well, uh Yes and no. Uh, international law up to the early 20th century was really, really Eurocentric. Yeah. And uh, it was basically a tool of Western colonial powers, yeah. leading powers uh, such as the UK, France, and other major European powers and uh, international law legitimated colonial uh, rule, uh, racial uh, discrimination, and uh, se sexual and gender discrimination. All these uh, evils, all these uh, negative uh, practices and policies were tacitly or explicitly endorsed by international law. But in the 20th century, especially after the decolonization period, uh, the content of international law began to change slightly, not fundamentally, because non-Western nations came to occupy the majority of international society in terms of the number of independent states and in terms of its influence in the uh, global discursive space, which is predominantly uh, occupied by the Western media and Western intellectuals. But still, the room has been gradually uh, becoming uh, larger for those non-Western intellectuals and peoples. And therefore, for example, if you compare the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 and International Covenants on Human Rights of 1966, the latter reflects far more diverse views than the former. Mm -hmm. and uh, those views of the developing countries and the views of the socialist countries at that time were more reflected in those international covenants on human rights. For example, the notion of self-determination of people was 
provided as common Article 1 of the International Covenants, whereas uh, the Universal Declaration of 1948 uh, did not have such a provision. So gradually, the contents of international law has changed, but not to a sufficient manner. And this adjustment of the content of international legal norms and also the global discursive space as a whole with the actual increase of material power possessed by China, India, and other uh, emerging Asian nations and some other non-Western nations is a very important task that we have to uh, address in this yeah. 21st century world. Yeah, so, so throughout the 20th century, and I guess you would say starting in the 1920s all the way to the 1990s, uh, Ulvo international law was a, a, a Western, really a, a Western paradigm. Little by little, it, gr it gradually uh, engineered room for the non-Western actors to notions mm -hmm. like, such as self-determination, sovereignty, non-intervention. Mm -hmm. And somehow mm -hmm. we have the possibility of having what you call this uh, civilizational diversity being preserved, in fact, being uh, enhanced uh, when necessary. And somehow you are, you are saying that uh, in the past 20, 20 years, since the 1990s, in fact, which have been very often viewed as the epitome of uh, a better UN, in fact, you are saying that somehow something here is changing and mm -hmm. that uh, um, through uh, the uh, erosion, for instance, of the principle of, of non-intervention, somehow this civilizational diversity is now more at risk than in the past. Exactly. Well, uh, last 20 years uh, have been a very, very interesting period from the viewpoint of global history and the globalization of humanitarian values such as human rights and also uh, environment, global uh, protection of environment. <clears throat> because on the one hand, as you have said, many remnants of traditional uh, religious and cultural teachings and precepts were attacked by the emerging norm of human rights and the protection of global environment. They suffered seriously from these attacks and they were compelled to change themselves and many of them have actually changed. But on the other hand, from the viewpoint of the changing power constellations, although in the field of ideational uh, power uh, area, uh, there has been a move uh, which I have just described, but in the field of economics and accompanying the field of military, you can see a very, very rapid increase of power possessed by China. Yeah. And India is following. And in another few decades, we will see far more clearly the resurgence of China and India as civilizational, economic, and military powers, rivaling or even in some respects superseding the United States. And yet, if the space of ideational power remains the same, there will be a serious discrepancy between the actual material power and ideational power, which is very, very dangerous for a stable, peaceful global order. Because if the U.S. people and Western European people behave on the presumption that they still have power and their way of thinking should be appreciated, as it has been, 
the pride of those researching powers such as India and China will be seriously hurt and they will naturally demand that the very way of thinking should be more uh, de-westernized and this will this may create a very serious problems to solve so yeah. we have to be prepared yeah. So in essence, you are saying that in order to achieve and preserve and even enhance uh, international stability, international order, we have to make sure that uh, power and principles are aligned. Uh, and uh, so if, if we have this disconnect, then we are running the risk of having instability. Exactly. Because law has always two aspects. One is ideational and pursuing normative values such as equality, justice, etc. But law, on the other hand, reflects power. Law cannot be born without power. Law cannot be maintained without actual power. So if there's a discrepancy between these normative aspects uh, the area of value and the area of power, then the legal order would naturally be very, very uh, uh, destabilized. Yes, yeah. right. And, and you feel that at the moment uh, there is a danger that uh, a sense of disconnect between uh, uh, the uh, redistribution of power at the international level with the rise of China, the rise of India, and the fact that we are still you know, uh, thinking on the basis of Western principles could be a source of uh, destabilization. Well, for example, the very fact that you and I communicate in English reflects the predominance of English language. But for the Chinese people whose national language occupy the largest percentage of the world, yes. they may feel it unreasonable why they have to learn uh, English rather than Chinese from the viewpoint of a certain reasonableness. It may be better for other people to learn Chinese rather yes. than in English mm -hmm. and to communicate with the other in Chinese rather than in English. But we all take for granted that we communicate with each yes. other either in English or in French. Yeah. which must be reconsidered yes. also. And uh, there are many of uh, those institutions that we take for granted, for example, uh, Christian calendar or a meridian. Uh, why meridian zero is in Greenwich, not in Beijing or Delhi, etc. Yeah, no, so these kind of things must be reconsidered with this new uh, changing realities. Yeah. So, you're, 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 so you're saying, Professor Numa, so that the, the requirements of, of global order, of global stability, calls for having power and principles being aligned. What about the, requir the requirements of global justice? I mean, I, I would imagine that uh, in order to have global justice, we also have to have an alignment between power and principles, and we need, I guess, to have power being put at the service of principles agreed upon. Well, even in the field of global justice, <coughs> there are always elements of power. For example, I have often written uh, like this, if someone in African continent in a very poor uh, village has a superior idea, which is far better for, global, uh, for the humanity as a whole, than the one possessed by a columnist of the New York Times. Yet, this superior power can never be universalized because there's no medium for this idea to be disseminated and to be shared on a global scale. Whereas the view appearing in the New York Times may be well accepted by the leaders of the world and globally shared. 
So even in the field of global justice, you have to adjust, you have to gradually change this excessively West-centric discursive space, which is dominated by powerful Western media. Mm -hmm. And only at that time, many ideas such as Confucianism or Hinduism or Islam can be evaluated on an equal foot basis with Christianity, Enlightenment, and many other Western ideas. And we may be able to find far better ideas in the traditional non-Western philosophy or religions than as we have today. Thus far, we have a very important idea of human rights, which was born in West Europe in the modern period, which I believe in personally. But in the future, we may be able to find out better ideas than human rights. And we always need to have some space, room, for those better ideas to be shared and globally disseminated. So, so in fact, you are calling for uh, a greater globalization of the public discourse, of public scholarship, and so on, uh, and, and, uh, and which is partly a de-westernization of public discourse, of, 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 of scholarship, and as a way to really widen the market of ideas and make the, the public and global discourse much richer and much, much more diverse. Right. Well, uh, it is, of course, uh, de-westernization from the viewpoint of changing the present uh, predominant uh, West-centric uh, structure, but a kind of a multi-civilizationalization. Uh, civiliza uh, civiliza uh, yes. <laughs> it is very difficult. Difficult to yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, And... Uh, Trans-civilizational perspective, which I have been arguing for last 20 to 30 years, mm -hmm. is one of the intellectual devices to uh, invite people to consider uh, into that direction. But in practical terms, I mean, how could it happen? Because, the, and I, I, in fact, I, I, I agree with you. I think that there is a need to somehow uh, de-westernize international law to what I call internationalize international law. But in practical terms, how do you go about this, uh, both from the, 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 the perspective of uh, uh, legal theory, legal scholarship, and then from the perspective of uh, uh, practice? How do you, what would be your, your recommendation, your recipe to make this happen? Well, as to the first question, I have been arguing that not only Western international lawyers or political science or any other intellectuals must learn uh, non-Western uh, intellectual uh, history of humanity such as Confucianism, Buddhism, and other intellectual uh, ideas and uh, histories, but also non-Western intellectuals themselves must liberate themselves from West-centric uh, way of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I just returned from giving the keynote speech at the European Society of International Law meeting in Tallinn, Estonia. And uh, in this speech, I said to the audience, we are all children of Franz Fanon. Mm -hmm. uh, Non-Westerners may be color, so-called colored people or non-Europeans, yet our brain yeah. has been very, very West-centric. I myself has been very West-centric. I studied very seriously Hugo Grotius, John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Max Weber, etc. And it's only last 10 years or so I seriously started studying Confucianism and other non-religious thoughts. So, so, so 
<laughs> no, it's a very interesting yeah. point. So, in fact, you are saying that it's not only for for for, for Westerners to de-Westernize themselves; it's also for non-Westerners to de-Westernize themselves. Right, and uh, Franz Fanon was very, very correct in pointing out that non-Western intellectuals are, generally speaking, so Westernized, so they are detached from their own peoples. Yeah. They cannot represent very naive and deeply felt aspirations and desperations held by a non-Western people. They very easily ally with Western intellectuals and communicate in a very West-centric terms, which must be rectified. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not an easy task. I myself have found it very difficult to change my own way of thinking, but we must do this. And, and, and I think this is something which, uh, which applies both to, to intellectuals uh, uh, in the non-West, but also to policy makers and to even uh, politicians and, and political elites uh, in the non-West. Exactly. And uh, I think uh, in the United States uh, there has been a <laughs> Uh, kind of uh, uh, political uh, fashion that they do not use any politically incorrect <laughs> terms such as crusades, etc. But that's only a very superficial phenomenon. Mm -hmm. In actuality, most of the U.S. Uh, leaders are incredibly ignorant of the outside world. Yeah. And this state of affairs must be rectified. For West European uh, political leaders, the situation is much better than if compared with uh, US political leaders. But still, their uh, understanding of the outside world is basically restricted uh, within the domain of European civilization. They may be able to speak in French and in German or in Italian, uh, in English, etc. But once the problem is beyond the pale of uh, yeah. European civilization, they are also very, very ignorant mm. and uh, they have very biased views. Mm. Unfortunately. And, and, and it's interesting because, in fact, you are describing us, and once again, I tend to agree with you, you are, uh, uh, you are describing us a world where somehow blindness and deafness uh, prevails. So in the West, in a way, we are blind and deaf to the other, but perhaps even more problematic, in the non-West, very often, intellectual and political elites are, are, are blind and deaf to, to themselves because they have been westernized. So how do we go about, and, and of course, you see, if you don't see the other, you cannot see yourself, and you cannot, if you don't see yourself, you cannot see the other. So we have a bit of a, a difficult predicament here. Exactly, and uh, for example, uh, I take another example in the field of human rights. Many liberal Western leaders characterize the resistance coming from non-Western world uh, to be critical of some preachy interventionist discourses given by the Western human rights activists or human rights experts, characterizing them as a kind of a uh, very convenient tool to protect the present discriminatory or authoritarian regimes in the non-Western world. Well, to a certain extent, from the viewpoint of political functions, their criticism is correct. But what they fail to see is this feeling of reservation, this feeling of anti-interventionist uh, emotions. And this feeling of 
hypocrisy held by Western intellectuals and activists are not only those who try to defend authoritarian regimes. They are shared by far larger number of ordinary citizens. And many human rights activists in the non-Western world cannot represent properly those hidden uh, dissatisfactions or desperations widely shared by masses because mm -hmm. they are detached from their own people and they are ignorant of themselves. Yeah. So only when non-Western intellectuals can properly represent their own people, their mm -hmm. own aspirations and desperations and dissatisfactions, then we can communicate on a truly equal footing basis. So the, 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 the diagnostic that you are putting forward is not simply about uh, the divide between the West and the non-West, it's also about the divide existing in the non-West between Westernized elites and people who are just local people and, uh, you know, uh, identifying uh, in all uh, honesty with their own culture and so on. Exactly. I have been always critical of a very simplistic divide between East and West because mm -hmm. both East and West are not monolithic. Uh, they have a diversity of views and uh, feelings. And therefore, uh, even I, who has been arguing for reappraising uh, non-Western values, even I have been regarded as too much Westernized, if viewed from Japanese ordinary citizens. Simply being uh, in the position of international lawyer means something alien to mm -hmm. many Japanese ordinary citizens. Well, Professor Onuma speaks uh, in a, such a fluent manner in English, and, they, mm -hmm. and he deals with international law. He is different from us. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very widespread feeling of ordinary Japanese citizens. Mm -hmm. And this is valid to most non-Western intellectuals dealing with international or global affairs. Yes. We have to appreciate this fact. Frankly. No, 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 uh, absolutely. So how do you go about finding the, the, the right balance and somehow pursuing what is right uh, in general and as applied to, to, in, to human rights without ever being uh, self-righteous? So how do we go about finding this uh, right balance uh, in, 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 in normative and intellectual terms and in, in political terms? Of course, it's very, very difficult, but what would be your path? Well, uh, that is exactly why I have been arguing uh, the need <coughs> for trans-civilizational perspective for the last uh, few decades. Yeah. And there's, of course, no single solution, no single answer to your very most difficult question. What I can say is at least we have to learn non-Western wisdom, non-Western thoughts, non-Western ideas more seriously. On a very superficial level, and in principle, all Western intellectuals agree with me that we need to learn more from non-Western philosophy, Confucianism, Islam, etc. Yet, what they actually do yes. is to continue learning only from Western sources, yes. ignoring non-Western intellectual yes. uh, assets, which, is, which must be rectified definitely and very quickly. Yeah. And, but Professor Numa, if I may, this is not simply a problem that we encounter in the field of law, this is a problem that we encounter in the field of philosophy. I mean, by training, uh, I, I am a philosopher and I, haven't, I, sp I happen to have spent time in Asia, and spending time in Asia, I, re I realized how provincial uh, and non-global my, my knowledge was, because in the, you know, when you think about it, philosophy is the ambition to think uh, about the universal in a universal fashion, and yet most of the time in the West, as in the non-West, we do this on the basis of very, very narrow cultural foundations, and it's not good enough. Well, 
I have myself, as I said, learned uh, Western philosophy, such as Kant, Hegel, and all other famous uh, Western philosophers, and have always found their worldview is very limited. Yeah. You are quite right in pointing out that once you put yourself in some non-Western world context in a serious manner, then inevitably you will find how your philosophy or worldview is narrowly defined and must be enlarged by learning seriously other uh, serious thoughts. Because it's only natural that West occupies less than 20% of humanity, yeah. and the rest, 80% of humanity, must have produced as good, as excellent as Western philosophies. Yeah. It's only natural. So Absolutely. you must seriously take yeah. into consideration. And, and, and so you, you mentioned that it's only in the past 10 to 15 years that you yourself have, have, have started to really be very serious about this. So what are the, the findings of this uh, 10 years, 15 years of intellectual journey as a way to, to try to, to go beyond, to see beyond the West? What are, what well, are the findings of your, uh, of your, of your journey? Well, uh, I have found myself very, very extremely interesting to find out my own ignorance. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important uh, cognizances which I could acquire is almost all major uh, philosophical or religious thoughts are almost all egocentric, and universalistic. Mm -hmm. Confucianism, Christianity, Islam, or Kant's philosophy, or Hegel's philosophy, all these are naturally, it's, a, it's just a truism, a repetition of truism, very egocentric, and yet universalistic. Mm. But learning different uh, philosophies, we can relativize ourselves, our positions, how narrowly defined ourselves, we can find out these things. And uh, another interesting factor is, although Confucian centers uh, Sinocentrism and Christian-centered uh, Eurocentrism, and Islamocentric uh, worldview all share egocentric universalism, but there are, in my view, significant differences. On the one hand, on the part of Sinocentrism, there's very little incentive for proselytization, mm -hmm. lack of proselytizing zeal is a very important feature of Confucianism and Sinocentrism, which is based on this Confucianism uh, to a great degree. According to this philosophy, well, uh, Chinese uh, literally class uh, civilized people and others as uh, savages, barbarians, but they do not possess proselytizing zeal to civilize others, mm -hmm. whereas both Christianity and Islam, they were also egocentric and universalistic, but they share proselytizing zeal. Mm -hmm. And because they feel sorry for those non-believers to go to hell after death, they feel it their duty to, to proselytize to change their uh, wrong uh, beliefs. So although all three share egocentric universalism, but whether it has proselytizing zeal or not, there's a sharp distinction, it seems to me, between Confucianistic sinocentrism and Islamocentrism and Eurocentrism. But, so uh, this it, is one of the... 
Uh -huh. this, this is going to be key. Fine. But it's an interesting point because so what does it mean? You know, we, we, we all talk about the fact that China is rising. And, mm -hmm. and, and so I guess that uh, the question for the future is going to be whether or not China is going to be able to transform its economic power into political power. And part mm -hmm. of the answer to this is based on uh, whether or not... Uh, uh, Chinese values can be uh, universalized and whether or not there is a, a desire in, in, in China to become a global political power. But if, uh, and I, I believe you are right once again, uh, so since we don't have this kind of uh, zeal for, uh, you know, expanding or bringing home the other, what does it mean for, for a new world order in which China would have greater weight? Well, the irony is contemporary Chinese people themselves do not necessarily share this long-standing value of, uh, or uh, at least tendency of non-proselytization. Mm -hmm. Because the contemporary Chinese leadership and Chinese citizens are obsessed by their memory of modern history. Mm -hmm. According to their interpretation of history, they were powerless in terms of economic and military power. Therefore, they lost opium wars, and therefore, they were virtually colonized, and therefore, they suffered from national humiliation. So, in order not to repeat this tragic history, history of humiliation, we have to possess actual power. And they do not value ideational power as their ancestors did. Mm -hmm. They value actual power, military Material power, power. Mm -hmm. and economic power. Mm -hmm. So I have been arguing to the Chinese people, well, remember your great history of pre-19th century world. You were so respected and admired by neighboring nations because of your ideational and cultural power, not necessarily military power. And you valued highly these ideational and cultural power rather than military power. And yet, you are obsessed by the only one century history and forgetting all your important cultural assets mm -hmm. of valuing this cultural and ideational power. So we all have to tell people it's not for the sake of military and economic power that one nation is respected. We respect French people, not because they possess nuclear power, but they possess very, very sophisticated, elegant culture. We respect British people, not because they possess nuclear power, but because they have a long tradition of parliamentary de democracy, etc. So Chinese people, still contemporary Chinese people and leadership are very young, and they are strongly obsessed by this memory, humiliating memory of modern history. Okay. So they have to liberate themselves. So, so two of your key findings uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, intellectual journey, so uh, most um, uh, philosophies are egocentric and yet universalist, then we, we don't have this, uh, you know, uh, Islam and Christianity are... Uh, about uh, proselytization, which is not the case of uh, the, the Sinocentric well. Any other key findings? Well, uh, I'm not an expert of this comparative uh, civilizations, so yeah. I should not uh, be boastful. And uh, in addition, the observation which I have shared with you may be completely wrong. This is just based on my superficial yeah. reading of the last uh, 15 or 20 years of mm -hmm. my uh, comparative civilizational mm -hmm. studies as an amateur scholar, not yeah. as a very professional scholar. 
But I don't know. I think it's interesting. And so you, you are telling us that in the past 20 years we have been we have been witnessing a major shift in terms of uh, uh, having uh, uh, civilizational uh, diversity and attack. So uh, does it mean, for instance, that when we see uh, misery uh, in a country, so how do we balance uh, the fact that uh, uh, that we have to do something to help people without yet being self-righteous? So how do we help people? without being self-righteous, without somehow undermining civilizational diversity. How do you draw the line? Well, of course, there's no absolute answer, and uh, answers must be found out in each specific cases. But uh, I have seen so many human rights activists and human rights experts in my own life as a scholar and human rights activist, uh, especially Western human rights activists, who are very good-willed, mm -hmm. but who are ignorant of cultural diversities. So I personally basically believe in most of the values which are advocated by human rights activists. But the way they argue invites a number of hostilities, repercussions. And also we have to recognize the fact the very idea of human rights is one of those historical products from a longer perspective of history. And the idea of human rights has changed and will change. For example, when the idea of human rights was born first in modern Europe, it was basically civil and political rights. But later, it came to include economic, social, and cultural rights. And now we are talking about third generation rights, including the right to self-determination, etc. And some of those Western human rights activists or human rights uh, experts still stick to the very original first generation rights, civil and political rights, and they are obsessed by excessive civil and political right centrism. And this must be rectified. Although in the last 20 years we have witnessed some efforts to rectify uh, this uh, uh, liberty centrism and try to encourage uh, those rights, economic, social, and cultural rights. Still, many intellectuals' ideas are obsessed with this liberty centrism rather than comprehensive idea of human rights. Uh, and, and perhaps as a way to end our conversation, because at one point I know that you, you have to go to two questions, you know. If you were a young scholar, I mean, no, you are a professor, you are a scholar, and, and, and uh, so if you, you were in a position to give advice to the next generation, you know, what, what kind of uh, advice would you, uh, would you give to, to a young scholar in the West, a young scholar in, in Asia, so in terms of trying to do a better job than we did uh, mm -hmm. as, as legal scholars, as, as intellectuals? I mean, what would be your, your recommendation in terms of a research agenda? in terms of, of a teaching agenda? Well, <clears throat> I have always advised my daughters, I have two daughters, to learn Chinese and English in order to survive the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And this may be different, uh, this could be different choices. Maybe you could choose French and Hindi, or you could choose Spanish and uh, Arabic. But we still live in this predominantly West-centric world. And modern West-centric world has certainly produced a huge amount of knowledges, understanding of the world, we still have to learn greatly from this accumulated 
knowledge and cognizance of the world. And yet, as we have discussed, we are desperately, excessively West-centric, so ignorant of non-Western uh, civilizations. So we, our future generations must learn, either he or she is in the West or in the West, either in France or in New York or in Tokyo, in Uganda, any other places, he or she must learn both this accumulated great achievement of Western, modern Western civilization on the one hand, and to relativize this by learning seriously Arabic, Islamic, or Confucianist, any other non-Western <laughs> civilizations. It's not just a superficial undertaking. It should not be. You have seriously spent your time to read Analects, to read Quran, in addition to reading Kant or Hegel or Weber, etc. That's not only theoretical, but practical advice. Because if you are a business person and exchange your views and signing contracts, if you can, for example, cite some famous Chinese poems as an American, the counterpart would be surprised and would greatly appreciate his or her understanding of Chinese civilization. It does count. No, 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 you're absolutely right. And, and, and in terms of scholarship, what do you think should be the, 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 the questions in the field of law, in the field of philosophy, because you're also a, a, a philosopher? Uh, what are the, the, the questions, the issues uh, on which you think uh, we should help the next generation to focus on? Well, uh, I think... Uh, in terms of uh, educational uh, schemes, we put uh, emphasis on history, global or comparative civilizational history in low school curricula mm -hmm. or in graduate school curricula. And uh, in order to understand the world of the 21st century, we desperately need the knowledge of different civilizational histories. So many people today are ignorant of history, especially history of diverse, different civilizations. This must be rectified at the educational level, and the curriculum must be changed according to this line. I firmly believe in this. Yeah. Yeah, and and yourself, what are uh, I have here your, your your latest book? I mean, based on the uh, Hague uh, Academy of International Law. What are what are the uh, uh, issues you intend to focus on for the ten coming years? I mean, what is your next intellectual agenda? I guess that you're going to deepen what you have been working on in the past uh, twenty thirty years. But what are the questions on which you are focusing now for the future? Well, I personally am uh, spending most of my time to revising and uh, uh, translating into English my textbook on international law, which was published in Japanese in 2005. And uh, I have uh, the project of publishing this by a major uh, British uh, publishing company in a few years. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, I would like to deepen my study on the problem of cultural heritages, especially world heritages. And uh, like the field of human rights or any other intellectual field, the the problem of cultural heritages has been dealt with in an excessively West-centric manner. Mm -hmm. If you look at world heritages, many are centered in Italy or France or Spain, mm -hmm. etc., rather than other regions. And uh, this 
subject is very interesting, and it should be, in my view, a part of global environmental problem, because we human beings live as human beings, not as natural person, but also cultural being. And not only natural surroundings, natural environment, but cultural environment is extremely important for our human beings to live in a humanitarian manner. And what kind of cultural assets, cultural heritages, future generation will receive from the present and past generation is highly important for them to think of the world. So the problem of cultural heritage is, is as important as the problem of natural uh, environment, in my view. What about helping uh, um, uh, non-Japanese scholars to understand and, and get to know better the, 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 the Japanese view on international law? Because there is, I guess, also a tradition uh, a Japanese tradition, a Japanese understanding of international law. I mean, uh, as you know, I lived in Japan for a few years and I'm very much attached to Japan. Unfortunately, my Japanese is not good enough to really read in, in Japanese. And I, 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 I have been looking for interesting uh, texts that I could read on the Japanese take on international law. And, and I think that could be also interesting. Well, uh, unfortunately, as we discussed, past Japanese international lawyers were very much uh, West-centric and assimilative to predominant uh, mm -hmm. West-centric international legal studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, there has not been uh, much uh, Japanese international legal studies which can be characterized as uniquely Japanese. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, one good news is the Asian Society of International Law was mm -hmm. established at the beginning of the 21st century, and we are going to have the third uh, biennial conference in Beijing, Beijing this year, yeah. this August. Mm -hmm. We held our second conference in Tokyo in 2009, Mm -hmm. And this year, 2011, we are having the third conference in Beijing. And thus far, this Asian society has been extremely successful. For example, the Tokyo conference uh, attracted more than 600 participants mm -hmm. and with leading international lawyers coming from the United States, such as Edith Brown Wise, and from Europe, such as uh, Mati Koskianimi, and uh, from Asia, uh, such as Anand, etc., etc. So with this uh, activity, very, very active uh, undertakings of Asian Society of International Law, I think, uh, together with American society and European society of international law, uh, the diversification or multi-civilization <laughs> of international law or globalization of international law in the true sense of the term mm -hmm. will gradually occur. And the younger generation, Asian international lawyers and a number of European international lawyers have become more, more and more multi-civilizational. My theory has not been, uh, has not only been supported by Asian or non-Western international lawyers, but a number of European and some Ameri North American international lawyers have mm -hmm. found my theory interesting and very supportive to which I'm very grateful. Yeah. No, because I guess there is a huge amount of work to be done in terms of history of international law from a non-Western perspective, and I guess it has to be part of the intellectual agenda of, 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 of young scholars in, in Asia to rediscover mm -hmm. their own legal tradition and so on. Right. Mm -hmm. And in this respect, what is m most interesting to me, it seems to me, although I'm ignorant of this, is 
to seriously study the history and the theory of Xiao, which is a yeah. kind of Islamic international law. Because uh, in terms of law, uh, East Asian civilizations has not valued law so much, unlike European and uh, Islamic civilizations. And instead, uh, they had a very sophisticated uh, normative system based on uh, social and uh, individual uh, morality and ethics and social eth eti etiquettes. And uh, it is also interesting to study these uh, traditional ide normative ideas from the viewpoint of international law, but more directly interesting seems to be the study of Xiao and yeah. the pre-modern uh, Islamic world yeah. and uh, how we can uh, learn from this uh, normative system. It, it may be an interesting undertaking.